Maya Gavietta is a professional surfboarder, but she's not like most surfboarders because where she surfs is in Nazaré, Portugal, the home of the largest waves in the world, waves that rise as high as eight stories tall. And so not only is she facing the difficulty of being a female in a male-dominated sport, facing the ridicule and the really not getting much attention and thought as to her skill, but she's also going after waves that most surfers would not even dare, dare go near. If you know anything about surfing, maybe you've seen videos or you've, maybe you've attempted it yourself. With, with most, most waves and most surfers, you just kind of powder yourself out to it, right? You get on the board and you kind of get yourself out there. And then when the wave comes along, you get yourself up on the board and you, and you get ready to ride along. But not with these waves. With these waves, you have to be towed out by a professional jet ski, jet ski driver. And so he takes you out there. And he has to have the skill to not only get you out on the wave... But if you fall, he has to have the skill to find you and get to you and pull you out. I don't know which one sounds more frightening, (laughs) being up or towing you too. But that's what takes place every year in Nazaré, Portugal. 2013, Maya attempted to surf a 50-foot wave. She was towed out to the wave, climbed up on the wave, and was riding high on her board. But the vibrations of the wave were so great that it shot the board up, breaking her ankles in in the midst, and sent her off the board. And when she hit the water, what came after her was a mountain that crashed down upon her. She fractured her spine. The air was knocked out of her. The life jacket she was wearing was stripped right off with the force of the water, and she went unconscious. Her jet ski partner frantically tried to find her, and upon finally finding her, grabbed her and rushed her to the shore where her team was ready to perform CPR to try and keep her alive. They rushed her to a hospital, and amazingly, she survived. What followed the next day on all the broadcasting stations was ridicule. Her fellow competitors, even a man that she looked up to as a hero of the sport, said things such as, she never should have attempted this, she simply did not possess the skill. And what followed after this this accident was four years trying to recover. Several spinal surgeries were given. She lost all of her sponsors and suffered with anxiety and depression regularly during each of those four years. Now here's the question. How could someone like Maya ever possibly try to get up and go forward? How could someone in her situation, someone in her shoes, ever possibly get up and go again? You know, we're looking at someone this week, and Ricky did a marvelous job of introducing it. We're looking at someone who's well familiar familiar with life storms, with tragic times. In fact, if there's anything that that speaks to us from the life of Joseph, the one powerful lesson is how to remain steadfast in the midst of life storms. Joseph's life is, is a wealth of godly principles, a wealth of examples of what it means to walk with God in the darkest of times. And so this weekend, we've given the title to to the things we're going to be talking about, Seven Principles from the Life of Joseph, because his life is a grand illustration of some of the most powerful principles God has given to us to, to wield in our own lives. Let's just be honest about something, young people. We faced a storm last year. You all faced a storm last year. There was a lot of challenges to being a young person in 2020 with everything that happened with the pandemic and the social distancing and everything that happened this past year. And if there's anyone who can say, I know what it's like to be a young person and face some tough times. If there's anyone who can offer a word of hope for facing troublesome times, it's Joseph. But before we get to his trouble and before we get to the storms and before we see all that he faced, we've got to take some time and we've got to We've got to get the story. 
We've got to paint the picture. How did he end up where he was when everything happened? And you know, that's kind of hard. I was walking with Ricky with this. Where do you start with Joseph's story? Because it's a messy story. And I think maybe the easiest place to start is, is looking at Jacob. It all started with the man, Jacob, who fell madly in love with this beautiful woman named Rachel. Madly in love. In fact, he was so in love with her, he went to her dad and says, I'm going to work seven years so I could marry her. Seven years. And so the man said, yeah. That's fine. You can work seven years and you can marry her. So the agreement was made. There's something that's really important about Jacob that we need to remember. And that is that he was a trickster, a deceiver. It was in his heart. That's who he was. And so he deceived his brother and he got the birthright. He deceived his dad to get the heir to the possessions. He is a deceiver by trade. Well, here comes the day, the wedding day. He's going to marry the love of his life. And there it is. And Rachel's dad pulls a trick and deceives Jacob. And it's not Rachel on that wedding night. No, it is Leah, the undercover bride. I'm still kind of surprised. I don't really understand how he did it. But he tricked her and he married Leah. Well, obviously he's upset. And Jacob goes to, to Rachel's dad and says, this was not part of the plan at all. And he agrees and he allows Jacob to marry Rachel as well, marrying both sisters. What follows then is an endless story of jealousy. Leah is jealous of her sister Rachel because Rachel is the favorite wife and gets all the attention from Jacob. Well, God then allows Leah to have children and she gives birth to four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Well, then Rachel's jealous because she's not really able to have any kids. And so out of her jealousy, she gives her maid, whose name is Bilhah, to Jacob as a wife. And Bilhah has two sons, Dan and Naphtali. Well, Leah sees that and she realizes that she hasn't had any children for a long time. And then she gets jealous. You see where this is going? Do you kind of see the story? And so she's jealous of Rachel and her mate, and so Leah gives her own mate, whose name is Zilpha, to Jacob as a wife, and she has two sons, Gad and Asher. Shortly after, Leah has two more sons, Issachar and Zebulun, as well as a daughter named Dinah, and so she has six sons given to Jacob. And then finally, finally, after all those years and all that back and forth and that jealousy, Rachel is able to give birth, and she has two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. So that's the household that Joseph came into. That's the mess that he was born into. But this is really where the story gets tough. This is where tragedy enters into the story. And I think sometimes we gloss over this first point. Because the first tragedy that Joseph faced came with his younger brother. When Benjamin was born, there were some issues with that, with that birth. And his mother, Rachel, died giving birth to Benjamin. I think sometimes we gloss over that fact. Joseph grew up without a mother. Some of you know what that's like. You grew up without a parent, without that loving, nurturing example in your home. You might say, well, at least he had a family to lean on. At least he had a family that would be by his side and support him in the midst of that, of that great loss. And that's, you already know the end of that story because he didn't. The other part of the tragedy is that his 10 brothers hated him as much as anyone could hate someone. And our story here in Genesis 37 tells us why the brothers hated Joseph. Let's write down three things, three reasons why the brothers hated Joseph. Here's reason number one. It was because he was a favorite son. We're in Genesis 37. We're looking at verse three. It says, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that the father loved him more than all the brothers, so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Jacob favored Joseph. Could be in part because this is Rachel's boy, and he loved Rachel more. It could be in part, as it says here, it's the son of his old age. In other words, all the other boys are getting older. They're growing up. They're teenagers in their 20s. They're getting married. But then when you get to have a boy again, I've got boys. Boys and dads have a special connection. Oh, they're adventurous and there's fun and there's play and they make you feel young. Sometimes they make you feel old, but then they make you feel young again. And you have that special bond. There's a, there's a special connection between a man and a son. And here he's living it all over again in Joseph. And you know the story. Is it any secret to the other 10 that Jacob liked Joseph more? I mean, it couldn't be more in the face, right? I mean, the more, the, the more obvious thing that Jacob could have done besides what he did is just hang a sign over Joseph's head and says, favored one. 
him. Bow down. Because what he does is he gives this gift. And this is what we attach to Joseph. It's not a shirt. It's not a black suit. It's a multicolored coat, which has two things. Multicolored, that would have been a pricey gift. That's pretty expensive. Dad is willing to go to no expense to shower blessings on him. But then number two, that's a showy gift. You can see that thing coming from a wise away, from miles away. Here comes Joseph and he's got his coat. When you see that coat, all he's saying is, dad loves me more. And obviously, as we read down there, did nothing but in, incite the jealousy of these brothers. Well, here's the reason number two. It's because Joseph gave a bad report. First two verses of this context, it says, now Jacob lived in the land where his fathers had sojourned in the land of Canaan. And these are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, in verse two, when he was 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, <clears throat> along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. I think sometimes we look at that and we say, well, Joseph was a tattletale. And so Joseph tattled on his brothers. I, I don't think we need to read that in there. There's a contrast that's being made in verse two and we need to see it. There's a contrast between the integrity and the trustworthiness of Joseph versus the moral emptiness of his brothers. Because we read about that all the chapters before. Joseph's 10 brothers were a mess Two of them were guilty of murder and they murdered a lot of men. Joseph's oldest brother had slept with one of Jacob's wives, which would have been some of those boys' mother. All of that is going on. And so when you look at verse two and it says that Joseph gave a bad report, it's not, well, here's a title telling brat. It's that here's a young man of character in the midst of a wicked home and he's able to be counted on, trustworthy on compared to the moral repugnance, emptiness of his brothers. And of course, they can't stand that. They can't stand the fact that here's a, an upstanding, righteous young man who never does anything wrong. And it all comes to a head. And out of all the boys, out of all the ones that God could come to, he comes to Joseph with these dreams. Verse five, then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, please listen to the dream which I've had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field and, and lo, my sheaf rose up and stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really gonna rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream in verse nine and he related it to his brothers and said, lo, I, I have had another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, what, what is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. You know, this isn't one of those dreams like you stay up too late eating too many Cheetos and you wake up thinking, man, I had the wildest dream. This is God showing him something that he can't get out of his mind. Something so, so divine, so amazing that he has to tell his brothers about it. Now we look at this and a lot of people say that probably wasn't a good idea. Probably not the best wisdom to tell the men who hate you, your brothers who can't stand you, that they're gonna bow down and worship you. And so maybe it wasn't the best sense of judgment, but let me just suggest something to you. This is me suggesting it to you. I would suggest that we resist the temptation to look at Joseph as nothing more than a spoiled brat who wants to rub his brother's noses in the fact he had this dream. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with this context. And it doesn't fit with what we know about Joseph shortly after. Because this young man is able to make some remarkable, mature decisions in some difficult places. And so that immature, spoiled attitude doesn't seem to fit the Joseph we read of shortly after. What it seems to be, look at verse 6. How does he even introduce the dream to them? He doesn't say, guess what? God told me something. <clears throat> Get ready, boys. I like my shoes nice and shiny. No, he pleads with them to listen. He pleads with them to hear because he recognizes this is something beyond me. This is something that, that surely is something given from God. And I want you, I want you to hear this. 
I want to be able to tell someone, I want to share it with you, whatever the case is. Whether if there was some braggadocious intent or not, they hear it and, and they've had enough. There are moments in life, maybe you've had it, maybe, maybe not, but you're going to have it. There are moments in life that when they happen, you're able to look at it afterwards and say, my life was never the same since that. Joseph's life was never the same again. His dad sends him because he's trustworthy. And so he sends him to go and check on the brothers. Interesting, I send it for our older students. Check out where he's sending them. Did you all check that, adults? You know where he's sending the brothers, Joseph? He's sending them to the murder crime, to, to the murder scene. He's sending them to Shechem. That's where the, the two brothers had killed some men not too long ago. There's no wonder he's sending Joseph. Is he gonna find a bloodbath? Is he gonna find more men dead? He's sending Joseph to go check in on the brothers once again. And you look at verse 18. When they saw him from a distance, before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Now then let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we'll say a wild beast devoured him. Then let's see what will become of his dreams. Do you see the scene? Again, they see him from a distance because, boy, there's that coat. There's that fancy coat. But do you hear the language? This is your brother. This is your flesh and blood. And their language is, let's take his life, let's cast him in the pit, and let's just say something happened to him. Let's see what happens now. Let's see what happens to your precious dreams when you're dead in the pit. Do you feel that? Does that make your, your spine chill a little bit? I mean, how cold, how evil to speak of your brother and say, we're just gonna take your life. We're gonna slit your throat and we're gonna just cast you into a pit. Well, oldest brother Reuben's not about to let that happen because he has to save face with his dad. He wants to be the hero. He can't be number one, but maybe he can be number two. He's made some bad mistakes. And so he convinces them, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit because he's thinking, I'm going to come back and I'm going to scoop him up and I'll come present the favored son and then maybe dad will kind of let all this go. And so it says in verse 20, 23, it came about when Joseph had reached his brothers that they stripped him of his tunic, his very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and they threw him in the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it, and they sat down to eat a meal. Notice in verse 23, what's the first thing they do? They don't hit him. They don't throw him in the pit. First thing, it's important, they strip him of that coat. Oh, that wretched coat. Every time I see that stupid coat, I think of you, and I think of our father, and I think how much he loves you. So the first thing they do, give me that coat. Give me that precious coat. And then they take him. Does it say they lowered him nicely into the pit? Got some ropes and some rags, and they lowered him down. They cast him into the pit. Well, there's no water, notice. Because what did they do in 25? I don't even know how you do it. Because they cast their brother, they throw him down. Doesn't matter if he's hurt, doesn't matter if he's wounded, doesn't matter if he's bleeding, he's in the pit. And then they sit down and they eat a meal. I've come to peace with this. He can whine, he can cry all he wants to. We're at peace. Well, these traders come by, you know the story. These Ishmaelite traders come by and they realize if they're going to do away with them, they might as well make some money off of it. And so it says, and it says in verse 28 that some Midianite traders passed by. And so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelite traders for 20 shekels of silver. And they brought Joseph to Egypt. You know what questions didn't enter their mind? You know, I wonder, I wonder what's going to happen to him. I wonder, I wonder what's going to happen as a slave to Joseph. Will they mistreat him? Will they abuse him? Will they kill him? It didn't matter. Because all that mattered to them was now he's out of our lives for good. Get him out. We don't want him here. Finally, it's done. And the story ends. When you look at verse 31. They took his tunic and the slaughtered male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Please examine it to see whether if it is your son's tunic or not. And he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Now, do you notice why we began where we did tonight? The deceiver has been deceived now by his sons. The weakness of Jacob became the weakness of his sons. 
The jealousy of the mothers became the jealousy of the sons. And Joseph goes from being the father's favorite, cast in the pit, sold to traitors, then bought as a slave in Egypt. Down, down, down he goes. Joseph knows what it's like to face the difficult storms of life. In fact, the story of Joseph, in, in many ways, opens our eyes to, to some hard realities of life. I've got a couple for you. Let's write some down. It opens our eyes to some of the hard realities of life. Like, number one, suffering is a part of everyone's story. Everyone's story. There is no one who is immune to pain and suffering in this life. Whether if it's, whether if it's just disasters, floods, and hurricanes, and earthquakes, and tornadoes, Maybe it's accidents or wrecks and they leave people injured or worse or even killed. Maybe it's evil people who hurt and steal and lie and, and take others' lives or it's sickness and disease and cancer. Job said it well, that man born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. No one is immune to suffering. And if there's anything that Joseph tells us, even young people can face some traumatic events in their few years of life. If we think, no, that's only for those who are older. That's a bridge for me to cross. That's a pain for me to face one day. No, Joseph reminds us even young people go through some painful, painfully difficult times in their life. The second reality is that we can contribute to our own suffering. I mean, you think about Jacob. Jacob the deceiver. Surely he never thought as a young man deceiving his brother or his father, one day this might come back to haunt me. And yet here it is, the sins and deceitfulness in Jacob's heart spills over into the very hearts of his sons, now deceived by his own kids. Or you think about what he did for Joseph. In his mind, he must have been thinking, I'm helping Joseph. I'm making him the favorite kid, the favorite son. I'm showering gifts, I'm giving him blessings, and yet he is not helping Joseph through what he has done. He's not doing any favors for Joseph, making him the favorite, because it is through his favoritism the boys get jealous and throw him in the pit. Jacob hurt Joseph. He did not help him. But maybe even think about the brothers contributing to their own suffering. They all had the same household. They all had the same father. Dysfunctional doesn't really describe Jacob's home. But you know, they could have risen above it. Joseph did. They didn't have to choose that path. Joseph did not make them hate them, hate him. They chose that path on their own. Sometimes we can make life harder for ourselves. Sometimes we are the ones who contribute to our own suffering. So when we choose to cheat rather than to study, when we choose to lie rather than to tell the truth, when we choose like the brothers to be jealous over things we don't have rather than thankful for the things we do have, we're sabotaging our own lives. Paul gives a principle in Galatians 6 and verse 7 that whatever one sows, this he will reap, which is a way of saying this. And you need to hear this. I know you've heard it before because this is old. But it's true. We are free to make our own choices. We are not free to choose the consequences of those choices. So I can choose. I can choose to be jealous. I can choose to steal. I can choose a path of rebellion. But you know what? I'm also choosing a lot of painful consequences that come down that path. I think the third reality is that suffering can come from doing the right thing because Joseph did no evil to, to deserve the treatment of his brothers. He did nothing to deserve their treatment of him. And as his story will continue, as we're gonna walk through tomorrow, there's a lot of times when Joseph does the right thing, but he's not given the right response. And so there's gonna be an occasion, a specific occasion when he's bought by a master whose name is Potiphar and that wife tries to get him to commit adultery with her. He refuses. He should be given a medal of honor. He should be given a gold plaque. Here is a young man in a tough place and he makes a great decision and instead he's thrown in prison. And instead he's slandered as an adulterer, as someone who tried to do something very bad. Sometimes, sometimes suffering can come from doing the right thing. And so we got some friends and they say, hey, I want you to come to my party this weekend. We're going to have a lot of fun drinks. My parents aren't going to be home. And we say, no way. No, I'm not doing that. And then afterwards, we're branded. And there's a reputation that skirts around us. Going out on a date, but I let my date know I've got some boundaries. There's some boundaries given by my parents and more importantly, some boundaries by God. And I'm keeping these boundaries. And I go out on the date and I keep those boundaries. I'm not moving across this boundary. And sometimes dates get dumped. Sometimes you don't get to go on dates. 
because of the boundaries that you keep. You get hurt for doing the right thing. I mean, sometimes we do something that's innocent, like, hey, do you wanna study the Bible with me? Do you wanna to come to a Bible study? Do you wanna to come to a worship service? And it's met with this evil response. You're just a cultist. You're just a religious nut. You know, Peter reminds us that there are times when God's people can do good things, right things, and yet suffer in response to it. Joseph shows us that. And I think a fourth reality would simply be that sometimes things get worse before they get better, because it certainly did for Joseph. In the pit, sold to traitors, bought as a slave, and it didn't get better yet. Thrown in the prison, forgotten and forsaken. You know what? He was 17 years old when he was thrown into that pit. There's a lot of people who estimate that he was 30 years old when he rises to second in command in Egypt. Think about that. Do some quick math with me. If he's 17 years old when he's thrown into the pit and he's 30 years old when he becomes the second in command of Egypt, there's at least 13 years when Joseph goes through some really hard times. Sometimes, sometimes things don't get better overnight. Sometimes things will improve right away. In fact, sometimes storms come in twos or threes or fours. Joseph knows what it's like to face some hard times. Joseph knows what it's like to suffer. But you know, there's something amazing to me about Joseph is that even though he faced these incredible hardships, there is something that existed within him that helped him withstand the storm that helped him remain faithful to God in spite of everything that he faced. And what he had with inside of him was this determined spirit of long suffering, long suffering. Do you know how we define long suffering? I mean, we might use words like temperance, fortified, strength, patience, endurance, words like that. Do you know what the second word is in that combined term? Suffering. Do you notice that? Long suffering is being hit again and again and again and again, and yet you're refusing to quit, refusing to throw in the towel, because that is exactly what Satan does to every single one of us. He hits again and again and again, and he thinks one more hit and he's going to give it up. One more hit and she's going to throw in the towel. Just one more and they're going to walk all away. And yet, instead of giving up, Instead of compromising on our faith, instead of walking away from Christ, it is the strength that says, I'm gonna take the hit, I'm gonna face the storm. I'm not walking away from Jesus, not now. It's kind of like Captain America who's hit again and again and again, and he's knocked down, but he grabs his shield and he stands back up and he says, I can do this all day. That's Joseph. Here's Joseph, and he's thrown in a well. Here's Joseph, and he's sold as, as a slave. Here's Joseph, and he's mistreated in the slave's house. And yet, and yet, in spite of all of that, how easy would it have been for Joseph to grow bitter and hateful and resentful? How easy would it have been for Joseph to blame God for all, all of his sufferings? How easy would it have been for Joseph to just be like his brothers and to choose to sin and make life easier, but not him? He kept his eyes on the Lord he held on to his faith. He remembered who he was. You wanna know how we define long suffering? I need you to write this down because we're gonna come back to it tomorrow. Long suffering is a faith that doesn't quit. It's a faith that doesn't quit. Even though we face hard times, we still believe in God. Even though we face the storm, we still trust in Jesus. Even though we face dark days, we hang on to our hope for better times to come. Even though the storm may be long, lasting seasons, lasting months, lasting years, but we have long suffering. That is, we're able to suffer long and to suffer a long time because we're placing our hope and our trust in the king. I love the story. I don't know if it's true. I went around when it happened. But Napoleon, supposedly, when he and his troops crossed the Alps, met an intense battle and they were losing and they were losing bad. And so he called to the bugle boy, I need you to sound the retreat. And there was no response. And so he looked at him again and said, son, sound the retreat. Our men are dying. And the boy looked at Napoleon and he said, sir, I've forgotten the sound of retreat. And so he said, well, blow what you know. 
And so he put that bugle up to his lips and he sounded three times, charge, charge, charge. And when the troops heard it, they thought help is on the way and they had enough strength and they withstood the battle. I love that. I've forgotten the sound of retreat. I don't know what it means to give up. Hit after hit after hit. I'm still going to be faithful to Jesus. I'm still standing with the king. I mean, let me ask you something. How, how do you get there? I mean, wouldn't you love that? Satan, you can throw what you want at me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how hard it is, how great it is, how long it is. You throw everything you've got, and I'm, and I'm not giving up. I can do this all day. I'm staying with Jesus. How, how, do, you, how do you get there? How do you have that kind of faith? How do you have that kind of spirit, that long suffering? How how do we get to that in our lives? I got three quick words, because this is the verse that came to my mind from 1 Corinthians 15. It's what I think of when I think of long suffering. Paul says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that uh, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I got three words, three quick words we're going to be done for tonight. Here we go. Word number one, steadfast. It's describing the foundation of your life, firm, stable, solid. What are you building your life upon? Because I will tell you something, far before the pit, long before the Ishmaelite traders, Joseph as a 17-year-old was built on a firm foundation because he knew who God was. He knew what God expected from him. He knew what it meant to follow and believe in God, even when far from home. Let me ask you something. What are you building your life on? What are you leaning on when things get hard? What what do you turn to when things seem to fall apart? Remember what Jesus said? When those hard times come and the winds blow and and the rains fall, what helps you stand? What sees you through? He gave that amazing parable at the end of Matthew 7, and he says it's the house that's built on the rock. The words, the words that he preached, the words that he gave, that's the house, or in other words, that's the life that's going to stand. There's some people, and they're building their lives, and maybe, maybe there's some here today, and this is where you're at. You're building your lives on popularity, how many likes, how many followers, how many Instagram likes or, or loves. There's some people, they're building their lives on money. There's some people, they're building it on sports. There's some people that are building it on, <clears throat> on relationships. None of those are designed to last the test of, of, of trials, the test of the storm. Because let me ask you something. We went through something last year. What happens in a year like 2020 when you don't have those friends, when you don't have those youth weekends? What happens when they take away the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, and the baseball too? (laughs) What happens? What happens in the year like 2020 when you lose your job? When all of a sudden COVID threatens your health, the stability of your life, what happens? Because I tell you what happened to a lot of people, their life fell apart. Their life crumbled. And there was a lot of young people last year. And they lost who they were. In a moment, everything that their life had been built upon was gone. They wrestled with whether or not they should still live. Because everything they stood for fell. And when you build your life on anything but Christ, when the storms come, whether it's hardships like 2020 or Satan, who's going to throw everything he has at you? If you're standing on anything but Jesus, it's going to fall. And so that means when the sun is out, when life is good and we are strong, we've got to ground ourselves in God's commandments. We've got to write his promises on our hearts. So that when the storms come and when the wind blows and when those hardships arise, like Joseph, even when they come, I know who I am. I know who I am. And I know who he is. And I know that he is always good in spite of anything that happens. And I know right from wrong, no matter what anyone says, no matter what happens in Washington or the school or or in my friends, I know it because I'm standing on the rock. I've taken the time and I've built my life on this foundation that will stand. 
Can you see it? How do you face the lies of Satan? God's no longer good. He doesn't care for you. How do you withstand the hardships of life when they blow? You build your life on what stands, on what lasts, the, the words of God. And then there's the word, I love the word, immovable. It speaks to our commitment. It speaks to our determination. It speaks to our resolve. They could throw Joseph in a pit. <clears throat> they could sell him as a, as a slave. They could cast him into a prison, but they could not make him leave the Lord or turn his back on his God. That's the idea. I cannot be sold. I cannot be bought. I cannot be lured. My life is in Jesus. It's like that tree, and we sing that song, that tree that is firmly planted on the water. Sometimes it's good things. Sometimes it's good things. That is, it's painted as pleasurable things that you would enjoy and that you like, and Satan loves to use those. You will have more friends, better friends, popular friends, if you step away from Jesus. You will have health, you will have money, you will have success if you step away from Jesus. You will have this boyfriend or this girlfriend you've always wanted if you step away from Jesus. You'll have that promotion, you'll have that job, you'll have that advance, you'll have that success in life. Social justice will be won if you do it our way and you step away from Jesus. But you see that language from Psalm 1? When the winds blow, my, my roots are dug deep. Those roots are planted. And they've grabbed on to him. And I'm not moving. So that when that wind changes and says, I'm going to take everything you love. And Satan says, I'm going to take your health. I'm going to take your friends. I'm going to take your wealth. I'm going to take your beauty or your hair. <laughs> I'm going to take your job. I'm going to take your loved ones. I'm going to take your life. We say, bring it. Bring it. Bring the pain, Satan. Cast your fiery darts. Because my life is anchored in him. I've set my root. And it doesn't matter how strong your wind will blow. I will not be moved. I'm immovable. I'm in him. And therefore, if we must move, Paul says the direction we move is not backwards. It's not downwards. It's onward. It's upward. It's forward. So Joseph, he didn't grow bitter or resentful. He didn't grow atheistic. No, he grew to become more merciful, more compassionate, more seasoned and sound in his faith than he was when he was a 17-year-old boy at home. One of the ways we win the battle, brethren, is I'm not going to let Satan steal my song. And I'm not going to let the winds that, he's, that he hurls at my heart keep me from becoming more and more like Jesus, abounding. Jeremiah, professional surfboarder, would have been easy just to hang it up. Would have been easy to quit. In fact, her fears alone kept her from being what she ought to be for a long time. Would have been easy for her fears to keep her from getting back on that board. Would have been easy for the doctors who told her you were never gonna surf again to keep her from trying. Would have been easy just to listen to the voices of the critics who said you weren't good then, you're certainly good, not good enough now. But she got back on the board. And last year in February of 2020, she went back to Nazare and she set the Guinness Book of World Records for the highest wave she rode and successfully landed on a wave that was 73 feet tall. 23 feet higher than the one she crashed on. You are going to face storms in this life. Oh, Joseph shows us you're going to suffer and you're going to face some pains. But that does not have to be the end of your story. Joseph reminds us it is possible to suffer, but to suffer long. To have a faith that faces the storm 
that endured the trials, that even though hit after hit that Satan may throw at us, we have a faith that will not quit. Our commitment to our king is greater than any pain that we will face in this life. No matter what, we don't give up. And so when you face a temptation that seems too great that you can't give, that you can't win, don't give up. When it seems like your friends have turned their back on you, don't give up. When it seems like the shame from your personal falling and failure because you've given up in sin is just too great to ever move forward, don't give up. Don't give up. Maybe when it seems like the pain you're, you're experiencing from whatever suffering it is in this life is just too great for the moment you're in, don't you give up. Don't give up. You may be in the pits today. You might be back on the Ishmaelite camel today. But that's not the end of the story. It wasn't for Joseph, and it won't be for you. You just stay with Jesus. You just stand with Jesus you just commit yourselves to have a faith that will take whatever it is that Satan throws and you will not give up. And I promise you what is on the horizon for those who are in Jesus is victory, is victory. And so tonight, if you are not in Jesus, tonight needs to be your night. You turn from those sins, you walk away from them and you put him on in baptism and tonight can be that night. You start that journey and you give your life to your king. Or if it be tonight that you are here and you have fallen and you've stumbled, you feel like you're in the pits, come right here and let us talk with you and let us pray with you and let's let you get to God who will help pull you out and get you where you need to be. Victory is for those who are in Jesus. If we can help you claim that victory, right here is where you need to be. Let's do it now. Let's stand and let's sing.